Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Hi, I'm Suzanne Spaulding, Director of the Defending Democratic Institutions Project in the International Security Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I want to welcome all of you to part one of a two-part conversation, connecting the issues of racism, national security, and civic education and empowerment. This conversation is part of a broader strategic dialogue uh, on Civics as a National Security Imperative. The, pro the broader program and today's program are generously funded by the Craig Newmark Philanthropies. We are very grateful for Craig Newmark's support. Today's amazing lineup of speakers will focus on the ways in which systemic racism, in addition to being a fundamental violation of our commitment to human rights, is also a national security issue. From sidelining essential voices and talents in national security, to undermining our influence around the world, to presenting an all too tempting target for adversaries to exploit. Tomorrow afternoon, same place, same time, four o'clock tomorrow, we will have part two of this conversation where we'll delve into the ways in which revitalizing civic education and engagement can help address the inequities and this national security threat. All of us must be engaged in the work of sustaining our democracy. Civic education can help equip us to be better and more effective agents of change and to hold our institutions accountable for doing a better job of living up to our aspirations. It can remind us of our shared values, of the value of democracy, and that it is not inevitable, but must be fought for every day. Moderating today's panel is my friend and colleague, Beverly Kirk. Beverly is a fellow and director of outreach for the Center for Strategic, uh, for the International Security Program at CSIS. She also heads our Smart Women, Smart Power initiative, and she hosts the Smart Women, Smart Power podcast. Prior to joining CSIS, Bev was a journalist and uh, worked for local and national news organizations, including NBC, NPR, and PBS, where she focused largely on domestic and international politics and government. But first, I have the privilege and honor of introducing today my former boss, Secretary Jay Johnson, who will help set the scene for our next two days conversation. Secretary Johnson is currently a partner in the litigation department at Paul Weiss, where I believe he was working in 2001 when he and I served together on the American Bar Association's State Committee on Law and National Security. Prior to that time, he had been Assistant U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York and also had been General Counsel for the Department of the Air Force. In 2009, he was tapped to be general counsel for the entire Department of Defense. Later, I had the honor of working for him when he came in as Secretary of Homeland Security from 2013 to 2017, during which time I was responsible as the undersecretary responsible for cybersecurity and critical infrastructure. I saw firsthand how Secretary Johnson prioritized <laughs> outreach efforts to communities around the country that might otherwise feel marginalized, devoting significant time to travel and meeting, particularly with communities of color. He devoted significant time and effort to recruiting Black Americans and other minorities to our workforce, including our cybersecurity workforce. I can't think of a better person to kick off this two days of conversation about systemic racism as a national security threat and the role of civic education. Then my friend, Secretary Jay Johnson. 
Secretary, thank you so much for joining us. I know you're supposed to be chairing another meeting right now, and we are very grateful. So let's get right to it. Over to you. Thank you very much, Suzanne. Good afternoon, everybody. Suzanne, I want to thank you for your public service as well and for your work as Undersecretary of the Department of Homeland Security. As many of you know, there is a new agency in the executive branch called the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA. What you may not know is within the executive branch, Suzanne Spaulding is probably the single person most responsible for the creation of that agency. She pushed for the creation of that agency and never gave up. And as the result, we today have an agency of our government devoted to cybersecurity. So thank you very much for that, Suzanne. I was asked to speak to you this afternoon about racism and, and the importance of civic engagement. If anybody asked me, is civic engagement important in bringing about social change? My answer is a resounding and unequivocal yes. I think I know why Suzanne asked me to talk to you this afternoon. I recently gave an interview and uh, about Black Lives Matter in the aftermath of Minneapolis, and the interviewer quoted my grandfather. My grandfather was a sociologist. He lived in the middle part of the last century. He died in October 1956. He wrote a lot about civil rights. He lived his entire life in the Jim Crow South, in the segregated South, rode in segregated railroad cars, uh, and notwithstanding all of that, notwithstanding the fact that my grandfather, my own grandfather, once had to testify before the House Un-American Activities Committee in 1949 to deny he was a member of the Communist Party. One month before he died, he wrote this, which the interviewer asked me about. Uh, and this was an essay from the New York Times. And this is a man who lived his entire life in the Jim Crow South. It is expected that Negro Southerners as a result of our limited status in the racial system would be bitter or hostile. Bitterness grows out of hopelessness and there is no hopelessness in the situation. Faith in the ultimate strength of the democratic philosophy and code of the nation has always been stronger than the impulse to despair. I believe that too. And I quoted it many times in speeches I gave while I was Secretary of Homeland Security. That was Charles S. Johnson, my father's father. On my mother's side of my family, my mother was a native Washingtonian. Her family were all native Washingtonians. They were all postal workers. They found job security and stability living in the nation's capital in the postal service. And they believed in federal service. They believed in civic engagement. In my experience as a public servant and as an African-American who's lived 63 years now, in my, my experience, any great movement for social change needs to have within it as a centerpiece civic engagement. If you look at the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s, something that my own grandfather did not have the opportunity to live to see, we had within it uh, conservative elements, more moderate elements, and for lack of a better phrase, more, more aggressive elements. On the more conservative side, you had, for example, the NAACP. On the more aggressive side, you had uh, the Black Power Movement of the mid-late 1960s, and in the center was Martin Luther King. And uh, Dr. King realized that civic engagement, engagement with our government was crucial to bringing about social change. Though some may have been critical of efforts to engage uh, the government, uh, many believe that it was certainly important for passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And I saw this myself in government, being on frankly the receiving end of efforts to bring about social change. When I was general counsel of the Department of Defense, uh, we repealed working with Congress, don't ask, don't tell, 
I, I met and interfaced with, with many parts of the movement to repeal that law. Some, some more aggressive, ambitious elements, some more moderate elements, and those who knew how to have a seat at the table to negotiate policy change. That is critical to any movement for, for social change. Same thing with the movement to reform our immigration system. Uh, when I was Secretary of Homeland Security, very often there were those who, who would engage in peaceful protest, even disrupt some of my own speeches. Uh, but there were also people who we could sit down with and engage on, in the meaningful exchange of, of bringing about better policies. All these different elements of a movement complement each other, frankly. While some within a movement may be critical of others within the same movement, they all complement each other. Now, when you look at the present day efforts, Black Lives Matter, we see elements that uh, call for defunding the police. Well, it doesn't literally mean, if you ask people what that means, it doesn't literally mean defund public safety in its entirety. It means redirecting a lot of resources, funds toward things that might have the effect of uh, influencing the community, rebuilding a community in a positive way rather than pure policing. Many on the right would be critical of the message defund the police, but the reality is all of these elements of a movement complement each other. I think it's critical to understand that. I think it's critical uh, to understand that in how our democracy works. And I too have confidence in the code of the nation and our ability to affect change through civic engagement. Thanks for the opportunity to speak to you. Suzanne, back over to you. Thank you so much, Secretary Johnson. I'll take it from you here. Uh, I'm Beverly Kirk, and I direct the Smart Women, Smart Power Initiative here at CSIS, and I'm a fellow in the International Security Program. We have a panel of well-known national security experts here to talk about systemic racism and national security. Let me introduce them. Wendy Parker is the National Security Advisor to the Office of the U.S. Speaker of the House of Representatives. Prior to joining the Speaker's Office, she served as Deputy Staff Director and General Counsel for the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. She has also been an Assistant State Prosecutor and previously served as an attorney at the CIA and FBI. Elizabeth Renskoff Parker is Dean Emerita of the McGeorge School of Law at the University of the Pacific. Prior to becoming Dean, she was General Counsel of the National Security Agency, the NSA, and the CIA. She previously served as the Executive Director and CEO of the State Bar of California, and early in her career, she worked as a cooperating attorney with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. And Dr. Kyron Skinner is the top professor at Carnegie Mellon University and director of CMU's Institute for Politics and Strategy. She also directs the Center for International Relations and Politics, the Washington Semester Program, and the Institute for Strategic Analysis. Prior to joining CMU, Dr. Skinner served as the Director for Policy Planning and Senior Advisor to the Secretary of State. I should also mention she is a fellow at the Hoover Institution and a visiting fellow at the Heritage Foundation. Welcome to you all and thank you so much for being here. For our audience, uh, please know that you can ask questions of the panel um, through the ask a question button that is located on the CSIS.org website on this event page. So please find that and be thinking of your questions. And in about 20 or so minutes, we will turn to the audience questions and uh, present them for the panelists. So welcome everyone. I wanna start with the very general question um, and uh, ask it this way. Um, it was two years ago, I read an incredible op-ed by Sherilyn Eiffel, who is the president of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. And the headline on that op-ed, it said, it's time to face the fact that racism is a national security issue. Are we now facing that fact, given everything that's happened in this country over the past several weeks, and I guess almost a month now? Um, we'll start with you, Wendy. Dr. Skinner, let's, let's move to you and that, have you answer that question. Um, 
I do believe that racism is a national security problem. And I've seen it um, as an academic, as someone who's been in presidential campaigns on the national security side, and more recently from the standpoint of US diplomacy at the State Department. And the common thread that I see in all of these is that when you do not have people of color at the table, um, you can't represent America very well. And we, for whatever reason, are in a multi-generational period in which there just aren't enough African-Americans, Hispanics, and Asians at the core, core aspect of US foreign policy. Let me be a bit more specific. I think in order to represent the best of the United States, the world's most fully functioning multi-ethnic democracy, you have to have people of color in every level of government. At the State Department, for example, they're needed in greater numbers in the regional and functional bureaus. They should always be at the table. I don't believe in identity politics, but it makes sense to me to have China specialists who happen to be Chinese, who speak the language, and African-Americans who've spent time on the continent of Africa involved in regional discussions about US foreign policy. We don't have many at this time. We have very few as a result in the interagency discussions of the US on the making of US foreign policy. We have almost no one at the top of the State Department who is of color, and we have very few diplomats, those representing us out at post. It seems almost impossible to me to represent the best of the US when you don't have the best of the US at the table. There's something missing. What we have when we bring a more diverse group together is that we get different perspectives that you wouldn't hear otherwise. I see that in the classroom. I see that with my faculty, but I don't see it happening in US diplomacy. And if I could follow up on that, what type of issue or problem or challenge does it create when we are sending diplomats to other parts of the world and we may even be commenting on their internal situations where it concerns ethnic minorities? What kind of challenge does it present when those countries then point back at us and say, hey, what about your own problems? Um, I think let me answer that at a couple of levels. I think what it does when we have only one demographic uh, representing us abroad, for the most part, I think we get a particular point of view. Um, and that doesn't represent 300 million American people who live in a very vast land in very different states. And so I think we just get something that doesn't really represent us. And that's what really worries me. And it may be someone's interpretation of what that policy should be. Um, at another level, I think you asked me about, you know, when people point back at us and look at our own inequities on the race side. I, I understand that. But I see it a little bit differently than I think what you were, you were implying. Often they look at the inequity in the U.S. and they see people of color who are always agitating for change. And often I think that gives them hope because no one, I think, does it better than Americans in terms of um, peacefully making change happen. It takes us a long time. We expose a lot of flaws, but we actually do the hard work. So often, I think our international partners have more respect for us as a result of the way that we address race. But I worry now that we're inflicting wounds on ourselves by not doing the obvious thing. At the State Department, for example, we have enormously talented people of color um, who should be in more senior roles and who are talented and women as well. Um, and I'd like to see some structural approach to this because I think the outcomes would be phenomenal. And the Secretary of State would be, I think, hugely surprised um, at how we're received around the world if we do what I'm talking about right now. Elizabeth Ranskoff Parker, let me bring you into this conversation and get your perspective on this. Thanks, Bev. Um, I, I really hope that Dr. Skinner's more optimistic view is the one that will prevail as we go forward. But um, I'd like to maybe turn the conversation in a little bit different way. I totally subscribe to what I'll capture as saying 
unless we're diverse, we don't show who we are in these international settings. But I'd like, if I might, to start with a, a personal experience. Um, after leaving federal government, um, I was involved for several years in multilateral conversations on disarmament. And over several of these, I got to know two Russian counterparts. And on one occasion, they said to me, well, we know what your vulnerability is. I said, what's that? And they said, obviously, it's your diversity, your racial and ethnic diversity. Oh, no, I said, that's our strength. That's our, that's who we are. Well, you know, it's very interesting, because as I look back on that comment, um, I worry that both sides may have had something right about what they were saying. I say that from this perspective. We've learned now that the Russians are looking at our diversity, ethnic diversity, racial diversity, for that matter, uh, economic diversity, and they're targeting that. And they're looking at that as a way to weaken us. And so what I heard from those Russian counterparts was certainly accurate insofar as Russian policy was concerned. Um, CSIS has, I think, done a, a very fine job in its, its report on why Putin targets minorities. Um, Beyond the Ballot also talks about this. But putting my hat on again as a, a law school dean, I used to say to every entering class, you're coming in as stewards of something very precious. It's the cultural diversity that links us together. That cultural diversity is supported by a sense of shared values and understanding of our constitution, essentially civic education. I'm afraid I was a bit naive because as we'll begin to talk further, certainly tomorrow, unfortunately, we haven't been paying much attention to civic education. And so to that end, uh, Secretary Johnson's uh, commitment, and wisely so, that we've got to have civic engagement may have been somewhat disempowered because unfortunately we're producing now not, not just one generation, but for decades, students, now adults, who really don't understand our civic education needs and our civic structure. And of course, once again, the burden falls most heavily on those who are most disadvantaged. They're the ones not getting this kind of an education and they need it and we need to have them have it because frankly, it all boils down to if it doesn't work for any part of us, it doesn't work for any of us. So we really do have, and we see this now, I think in what the coronavirus and certainly the protests on police violence have revealed. And that is that there's a huge set of issues, structural issues, which we're going to have to develop pardon me, develop, we're going to have to address and develop new approaches. And that means civic engagement, and that's got to have a civic education preparation. If I could follow up with uh, that uh, uh, string on the Russian mis and disinformation and the ways that um, our adversaries are choosing to uh, use and target information, uh, particularly as it relates uh, to issues of race. Um, what more should be done to counter that by the United States? There is a lot of, as I refer to it as incoming, um, targeting people on social media and these different messages uh, containing mis and disinformation. Uh, what has to happen? Because that's a threat to the very fabric of this country. If you can get people fighting each other or disagreeing with each other, then your, your job is done with an attack on the United States, in, in essence. Conversation, is that a question for me, Bev? Yes, it is. Or Dr. Skinner, okay. Well, of course, I would start with the notion that we've got to be educating not just our K through 12 population, but our more, uh, what should we say, our adult population as well. And we've got to be alerting them to this attack at what is perceived by some externally as a vulnerability. And we've got to uh, embrace the notion that 
diversity is a strength, not a weakness. And I think one of the, the hopeful signs to the, the recent set of protests is that they are now finally bringing in not just minority populations, but also the majority white population, which has got to be a part of this solution. And so I think there's, there's hopefulness there. Um, we're going to have to be able to listen and we're going to have to be able to educate ourselves somewhat on the fly here. I thought that uh, Secretary Johnson's description of what defund the police really means was very helpful. And so I'm hopeful that as we go forward, there is going to be a national conversation that will serve to educate. Candidly, I've been amazed. I mean, I thought I understood something about civil rights from my time working in the South, but learning deeply about the failure of reconstruction, about what Jim Crow was all about in a much more profound way, the 1619 project, we really are going through what I think is a national re-education project. And I think, you know, my hat, my hat is off to those who are writing and talking about this. Dr. Skinner, as an educator, probably has a bigger role in this than I do. But I think this kind of a, if you will, learning even as these challenges arise, is going to be helpful. I would say, too, to the international perspective, how amazing that what we've done in response to the killings of so many African Americans over a number of years has now suddenly erupted as a parallel set of responses overseas. What better example of what Dr. Skinner has said, that we need to show our face as Americans, as leaders, not just of our own country on subjects of diversity and inclusion, but at an international level as well. Wendy, let me bring you into this conversation. Uh, tell me what, you, what your response is. Um, I couldn't agree more. Um, I was so heartened to see the response around the globe. Um, people protesting outside of our embassies initially, uh, but those protests grew. They grew to the main streets, main streets in London, main streets in Germany, main streets um, beyond, uh, just all around the world, France. Um, people were so moved by that. And they were so, you know, they were saying the same thing that people here in the United States were saying. They were repeating George Floyd's words. They were saying, I can't breathe. They were saying Black Lives Matter. Uh, they were saying an end, an end to injustice and equal treatment for all people. And so we were so heartened to see that. But what that did for me is just kind of underscore the fact that it has been over the years, the perseverance and the determination of the American people that has led to change in this country. America has been a beacon of light, a beacon of hope, a standard bearer. And I'm so proud to say that about my country. Um, and we have truly, truly led and inspired others around the world. Um, our democratic um, values and institutions mean so much. And if we are going to ensure um, that we maintain our values and also promote our values, we have to show that when we are all confronted with information and, and the reality of the um, systemic issues um, and failures of our system, that we address them. And I think the world is looking for to us to address them. And so we're really happy to see that um, because of this response um, by our civil society and the strong engagement here, and because of um, also um, responsible governments at all levels, um, we are seeing some change. And that's why too, at the federal level, um, Congress, um, we in the House of Representatives passed the George Floyd Policing Act, um, which identifies some things, some things in our current laws that need to be changed with respect to holding people accountable, holding our police officers accountable, holding our system more importantly accountable. Um, this is not to target police officers. This is to make the entire system stronger for everyone here in the United States. And so again, over the course of the years, America has corrected its course. And I think right now, this is a, this is a, this is a time where we need as citizens and as a government to rise to the occasion to do that. Um, also, with respect to, um, we hear about China, for instance, and there's great concern about the threats posed by China um, and also the Chinese, um, uh, the disrespect of the human rights 
by the mainland of the people of Hong Kong and Taiwan. Um, but how we need to also be um, mindful of the fact that um, human rights has been um, a cornerstone of America, American values. Um, I wanted to, to quote this great quote from um, uh, Suzanne Spaulding. Um, she mentioned um, in her op-ed this week in The Hill that system, systematic racism is a betrayal of our commitment to human rights and equality. And indeed it is. And um, that's why we have to continue to stand up for human rights here in the United States and around the world. If we don't do that, we lose our moral authority and we can't you know, ch exchange it for um, economic interest, trade interest or anything else. And so um, as we advocate for China to do better and, um, ad and we also advocate for our national security interests with respect to China, we have to be mindful of the fact that people are looking at us and they're quickly looking to our faults, which we need to correct. Absolutely. And Wendy, if I could just follow up, you mentioned uh, your colleagues on the Hill and the actions that have been taken. Um, do you think that, that members of Congress actually have? An well, this is not for the sake of the diversity. This is to make the national security community stronger. And indeed, I think that there are many who, rec who recognize that we now have just a plethora of challenges um, and we have to be as well positioned as possible to go after our targets, to make our country and stronger and to protect our national security and the security of our allies. Um, even though some people don't want to, you know, change the status quo and they, they want the national security community look like, to look like it did many, many years ago, this is not our world reality. And in fact, um, people are targeting us, as we mentioned, in cyberspace, they're targeting the US on the ground, they're targeting us in the battle space, they're targeting us at sea. And so we have to um, have a diverse tactical workforce who comes at these various problems with various perspectives um, in order to ensure that we are in the best position possible to counter those threats to our security. And so um, I couldn't agree with that. Let me ask another question and also uh, bring Dr. Skinner uh, in, back into the conversation. Why do you think that it's taken this particular moment or maybe the better question is, what is it about this particular moment that has precipitated such rapid change. I mean, the Mississippi State Legislature just agreed to revamp the flag and remove the Confederate flag part of it and do a new flag. Um, what is it about this moment that's different? Because these arguments are absolutely not new. I think that's the critical question. And thank you for asking it. Um, and I agree with the other panelists so far, you know, Wendy Parker and I are on different sides of the political aisle, but I could have given her speech. She did it better than me. So, um, but I, I really agree. And I think to answer your question is to really say that um, it's been right under the surface for a very long time. And we needed, we needed a triggering event. And why people are surprised is a surprise to me because many of us African Americans and other people of color and women who are fighting in the professional realm to open doors for ourselves and others aren't surprised by anything that is happening. We live it every single day, but it's just time in our country to put to bed some of the worst practices uh, that our nation has put forth in our state houses, in our local governments, at the federal level. It's, it was, it's well overdue, but a set of forces came together that I think just took the lid off of problems that were right under the surface and that we couldn't, we can't keep the lid on anymore. Uh, let me just speak to one thing that uh, Wendy Parker said. She said, when someone said, you know, diversity for the sake of diversity, I actually believe in diversity for the sake of diversity, because I think it is part of the key formula, which makes a nation great, which makes a business great, which makes a university great. Something happens when you've got intellectual, racial, and gender, even religious diver diversity, cultural diversity, 
in a workforce, in a community, something happens that would not happen otherwise, and it just changes the society and world. And the historical pattern of the United States is that every time we take on the problem of African Americans in this country, we come out stronger. In the wake of the Civil War, we got the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. I tell my students all the time, if I have only one amendment in the Constitution, um, if I had to pick one, it would be the 14th Amendment, Section 1, Equal Protection and Due Process, I'm good. And that became the, uh, you know, something that was the model for other countries around the world. Out of the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s, we get the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. We always do something that's transformative when we take on the Black problem. And it helps everyone, and we're doing it again. So let me follow up on on that. What do you think? I, what do, what else do you think may come out of this moment? We've seen monuments coming down. Uh, some some not willingly. The protesters have have brought them down. But you're also seeing different community leaders in places around the country saying, "Okay, now it's time to take them down," and it's being done in in a in a systematic fashion. What else do you foresee happening out of this moment? Um, so just let me speak for one second on the monuments coming down. As an historian, I want them archived. Um, I think the Holocaust Museum, I've had many of my students in Washington visit um, uh, when they're in D.C., uh, visit the Holocaust Museum to have a living witness to what has happened. So I want a living witness um, with those statues as many and, and, and images as many of can, can be captured and archived so that I can take my students there and say, this is who we once were as a nation, but it's not who we are now. Um, but in terms of big systemic changes, I worry. Um, I do worry that we'll get some new laws. Um, there'll be some you know, diversity commissions and more diversity officers hired and very little institutionally will change. My immediate concern is that we diversify the foreign policy community and the national security community of the United States because these are national security threats if we do not. Um, because we're not representing, I think, the best of our nation, the creativity that that diversity will bring. And the United States, for better or worse, is the hope and destination for so many oppressed people around the world. They need to see us at the top of our game not somewhere at the middle. And so I, I do worry, speaking to your question, that we get the kind of massive overhaul of how we hire and retain talent. That for me is a, is a problem every day as a faculty member. Um, and it is a problem for those in the diplomatic and government realms as well. And I wanna give Elizabeth and Wendy uh, an opportunity to respond to that question as well. Wendy, do you want to go first? Uh, go ahead, Elizabeth. Okay. Well, you're not going to be surprised to know that I will default back to saying more civic education. Uh, let me put it in this context. I think the, the endless surveys show that there's been a precipitous decline in trust of our government, um, particularly among, again, the disadvantaged communities. Well, there's a lack of trust because they are not educated, they don't understand, they've not been given an opportunity to do the kind of engagement that Secretary Johnson talked about. A recent piece of litigation out of Detroit is interesting. The students there claim they have a right to learn how to read. Well, verily. Uh, another lawsuit in Rhode Island by students claiming they're not being given a chance to learn about civics. The statistics are overwhelming. The time, the attention given to civic education since really the, the late 60s has been a precipitous decline and with it a lack of testing so teachers don't learn about how to teach civics, how to teach students how to engage in it. Something like 20% in a recent survey do only teaching in civics, mainly it's kind of a, an add-on. The result is a, a group, a large group of people, all but those who go to the most elite schools and high school, don't understand their government. 
they have every reason to mistrust it and they don't know how to engage it. And I think this is really where fundamental change is going to be necessary. And at the same time, we're going to have to learn how to educate ourselves about who we are and how we got here in order to begin to achieve the kind of structural change that we need. Um, the final thing I'll say is that I think what happened in the 1960s, and I was happy to be a part of it, was wonderful. There were clearly a lot of very important legal changes, but we didn't pay attention to the cultural underpinnings that are needed to make certain that those are not just changes on paper, that they actually make a difference. We have an opportunity now in the crises that we face, and we dare not fail to take advantage of them. Wendy? Yes, um, I can't agree more um, with um, Elizabeth and uh, Dr. Skinner. Um, you know, another, I, I think definitely, um, we are going back, Congress, we've gone back and taken a hard look at laws, laws that lead to um, unequal um, treatment of individuals, individuals going through the system um, and so forth. And we are, you know, looking to, um, amend some of those because a lot of these things need a fresh look. But I also think that, um, you know, it's, it goes beyond the laws. It also goes um, to, um, uh, again, education and mindset. Another thing that's very been very disturbing and of concern to me is what's happening with our military. Um, our military, each individual military officer, enlisted person, they all take an oath to uphold the Constitution. That's why when there was a suggestion that the Insurrection Act be invoked um, and used to control the protesters, um, that um, people became, who really knew what the military was there for, became quite upset. And the first people to kind of speak out forcefully and speak truth to power were our four-star generals. Um, who had served at the highest levels of the United States government, and some even who had served in this administration. Um, and, you know, uh, as um, Admiral Mullen, who was the former Joint Chair, Chairman of, um, former Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and also um, as General Mattis, who was most recently our Secretary of Defense, but also a four-star general who, um, you know, joined the Army 50 years ago, um, they said, and they cautioned against, um, using the military um, uh, against our civilian population and in our communities. Because as they said, um, our communities are not battle spaces to be dominated. Um, and and that's, that's, that's something that, of course, of course, many of us who are older and, and live this life, we know that, but we have to make sure that our children understand it and the world understands it and our children and, and generations fight to ensure that happens, um, that our, battle, our, our communities aren't used as battle spaces. Um, and we as citizens also um, have a duty really uh, to support um, the pursuit of peaceful assembly and um, the right to um, be heard and the, our First Amendment rights, which are of paramount importance. Um, also, um, we have to make sure that people know that our military isn't there to be overly aggressive. It is to really ensure that our national security interests are protected. Um, and that's why, too, that, you know, too, Congress has been looking closely at the Insurrection Act uh, because people do not want it to be abused. They don't want it to be invoked inappropriately. Um, and so many of us think about it when we think about Rodney um, King in Los Angeles in 1992 and the use of it there. Um, and it, the governor requested it. They requested the assistance. And so, um, but there are ways to use the Insurrection Act right now without a formal request from the government if the president does sign a proclamation. And I think that that is, um, so of course people are looking at that, but they're just kind of taking a long look at a lot of laws that are on the books. I think civic engagement is so important because people have to understand the laws that govern our country and why the laws need to be respected and why the laws cannot be exploited. And if they ever are, our citizens, citizens citizens must know that they should stand up against it um, and fight for our American values. 
I want to remind the audience at this point that you are free to ask a question. Go to the uh, CSIS website, this event page, and there's a little button that says ask a question and you can submit it. And we are beginning to get uh, a few and I want to turn to one of those questions uh, right now. It's from uh, uh, actually a CSIS colleague, Kevin Fashola. And he says, you've spoken a lot about the benefits of diversity in national security spaces as a strength and to show the world the best America has to offer. However, there are a lot of diversity skeptics who think it, quote, lowers standards. Um, it's political correctness. Um, it's a zero sum game uh, to the overall white majority. Uh, that's part of the question here. Um, so how, how should we make, be making the argument that um, to the people who are skeptics, really diversity and the stats back it up, diversity makes decision making better. If you're in business, it increases your profit margin. Uh, there have been studies about these things, but how do you make this work in the national security space where there may be a, a great deal of resistance to, to the diversity? Um, if, if I may, I'd like to jump in um, on that question, and I think it's critical. Um, I think the skeptics are, are becoming a smaller set of people, um, and the, the empirical evidence is against um, that viewpoint that um, diversity lowers standards. We have so many false binary opposites that govern our political in, in, um, discussion in the United States. If you have diversity, you have lower standards. If you hire a black person in a leadership position, they must be hired because they're affirmative action and on and on and on. That is, I think, rooted in a fundamental lack of understanding of scientific research of what has happened in this country when it's been at its greatest from a historical standpoint. So I think it's not to be taken very seriously, but just suppose you take it very seriously. Look at what's happening in the world. When I was at the State Department, I was one of the only people, if not the only one, that I heard saying over and over, we've got to be concerned about the coming power of the global South. Uh, when you look at, if there's so much focus on China now, but what about India, Pakistan, Nigeria, South Africa, Brazil, the countries that on a whole bunch of demographic factors and other statistics are going to be power players in the world. If you just happen to agree that with this particular reality, which cannot be stopped, America has a lot to do if it wants to remain a predominant power on earth. So for those who are really skeptical, I say, do you want the US to be a predominant, predominant power on earth? Usually they say yes. Do you want to buy the United States a couple more generations of freedom in the world at home and abroad? They say yes then they really have no choice but to do something that's very different than what America has done for the better part of the last 70 years in, post, in the post-war era. Right. Um, Elizabeth, Wendy, did you have anything you wanted to add? Uh, uh, we're getting a number of questions and I want to get in as many as possible. I'll add something. I hope I can be brief. Um, you know, I think there's an assumption that, okay, now everybody can apply, fine. But we know that it takes more than just simply that kind of a, a little, we say, an open door. Look at what's happened in our military, where they are as, I think, as successful as any have been in Im integrating the, the enlisted ranks and really ranks up to the flag star situation. But then we see that there's been a failure to advance. And you have to ask yourself why. We know we have highly competent, very diverse officers in our military corps, why haven't they advanced? And I think that's now being looked at. That's a structural issue. There's some problem that we're not addressing. Certainly part of it is mentorship. Are we doing the kind of things we ought to be doing to take talented people and making sure that they achieve their highest level of potential? If I could just do a two finger on that one, I know we've got other questions. I think there is, this speaks to um, what Elizabeth is, is pointing to at this point about structural problems where you hit a brick wall, um, no matter how talent, talented you are as a person of color, that we can put lots of controls in place. 
to account for certain parts of structural racism, but it's hard to change hearts and minds. And that is something no one's cracked the code on. But you can also figure out ways to begin to punish people who block other people because they look different or they think differently. And we've never really addressed how to do that, but they're going to have to be a new set of controls. And that's what I'd like to see in terms of a concrete institutional set of mechanisms coming out of all that's happened um, this spring, um, inspired by the, you know, the massive killing of African-Americans for no reason. There's a, a, a question from the audience that is a great follow on to this part of the conversation from Mia at uh, the uh, Commerce Department. Um, you say we need more education. Some may say that education will not erase the wealth gaps, racism, and biases that holds back certain groups. How would you respond to that? Would that be one for me? Please go right ahead. Elizabeth. Everybody. You know, I think that we, we start not just at one place, we start in a number of different places. And I'm not saying that there ought not to be other things we look at too. But when you consider the limited amount of support we give for, again, my favorite topic, civic education, you have to say there's something you can do here. We don't assess it in the same way we assess STEM topics. We don't require it. Therefore, it's not taught. So you know, again, Wendy, maybe this is one for you. If we were to require that the National Assessment of Education Progress treat civics, history, geography, those civic topics in the same way that we treat uh, all of the STEM topics, that we require the same periodicity in terms of, of assessing, that we also report not on a national level, but on a state by state level, we would be taking steps at the national level to make a major improvement. Clearly, there are any number of other things that can be done as well. And I, for one, am now no longer backing away from the idea of reparations. I think that's a topic we need to talk about. And just as, as we've been talking about defunding the police, it may not mean the same thing to everybody, but we have to start talking about how we make amends for an aggressive, historic, many centuries of keeping one group of people in a position where they really cannot thrive and survive as their natural potential would allow. Wendy? Um, yes, I couldn't agree with you more, Elizabeth. And that's why forums such as these are so important um, to ensure that you know we're focusing um, and having meaningful dialogue about these topics. And I, I agree, we, we had this hard push for STEM and STEM education. And we have now so, we have a beautiful, um, statutory architecture that relates to STEM education and advancing it because we realized we were behind other countries. Frankly. We saw Japan, you know, in the 80s going leaps and leaps beyond us. And then we saw kind of the threat posed by a China that was catching up to us. And some fear have, has now kind of um, uh, gone beyond us in the area of these kind of technical capabilities, including artificial intelligence and um, quantum computing and so many more things. Um, but now it's, it's time, it is time to focus on civic education. And, um, and I think that um, one of the things that's so important as Congress is working on legislation, legislation that impacts um, all initiatives, including education initiatives for our K through 12th graders, as well as uh, for our higher um, uh, institutions, um, we really like to be informed as we do that. Um, and so I think that this sort of dialogue and recommendations that come out of these um, sort of thoughtful um, forums um, are very, very helpful. Um, they're helpful for the general public as well as uh, your lawmakers. So look forward to more. <laughs> Our next question comes from Corey Cooper from the Paul Weiss Law Firm, and it gets back to the issue of national security. What are some specific changes that military and defense organizations should make in order to combat systemic and cultural racism from within? I, I, I'd like to speak to that one. Um, and I actually made this suggestion informally at the State Department, and it went nowhere because I didn't um, have the opportunity to stay longer. But I'm in Pittsburgh, um, where the Pittsburgh Steelers are a dominant force in our town. And the Rooney family instituted something 
um, that had a big impact on the NFL that I think should be represented all throughout our federal government, the Rooney Rule, that every time there's a job open, that there is a person of color that has to be interviewed. I think we need something as, really as severe as the Rooney Rule to begin to change the tr career trajectory to, general, to the general officer corps in the military and to the diplomatic corps of the State Department. Um, I think we just are going to have to take those kinds of measures. Um, and I don't see any other way beyond something that's profoundly clear to everyone. Another question that we have in this specific topic area, do you believe the public perception of national security institutions as more nonpartisan could be affected by recent protests and unrest? What greater dangers could arise from a drop in faith in the objectivity of national security institutions? Any takers on, on, on that question? Kyron? Yes. Um, the idea that um, national security or foreign policy is somehow different than domestic and economic policy, that it's nonpartisan or that it's bipartisan. I think, you know, those who really are in the trenches know that that's not true um, and that there's always a contest about what the national interest is and that it's not something that's subjective as much would like it. Um, many people would like to, um, to believe um, is the case. Um, but I don't think what's happening in the streets of the United States makes us more vulnerable from a national security standpoint. I, I want to go back to my point. I think it's who's not at the table that makes us more vulnerable. What's happening in the streets, I think, is also a reflection of who's not at the table in the national security community. And so in that way, they're one and the same. But, you know, there is a way in which we want foreign policy to, you know, to stop um, at the water's edge. And it, we, you know, as we go abroad, we're speaking with one voice. But when you're a country as complicated as ours, ultimately the commander in chief speaks for us all, but the, all of those working under him have a slightly sometimes different take. And I do think international partners understand it if we're something of a cohesive nation, it's expected. Wendy? Yes. I. I you know, I just kind of go back to uh, Mike Mullen in his op-ed penned in early June um, following George Floyd's death and the protest. Um, he warned against the use of the military for political purposes. And I think we have to just kind of be mindful of that too, um, that, you know, we, we just have to be very mindful of that uh, and about the role and the, the duty, as I described earlier, of uh, the people in our um, military, but also in our national security community. Um, and so um, we often, you know, years ago with respect to the Iraq war, we warned against the politicization of intelligence, for instance. And so we, we do have to ensure that we do protect the um, integrity of these important institutions so that they can most effectively um, pursue their, their, their missions. Um, I actually agree with Wendy. Um, but I'd like to add a little bit of a different twist. Um, I'm a great admirer of Mike Mullen. I, I worked for him as a on the CNO executive pa panel and did some work when he was chairman of the Joint Chiefs. So I get his larger point. But um, I think what he's concerned about goes back to Elizabeth's concern about civic education. Um, in the United States, steadily since the 1980s, to do a course correction, on some of the diversity issues that we're talking about um, in the, uh, you know, in American higher education. We moved away from teaching about the West. We moved away from teaching basic economics, military history, diplomatic history. Many times those histories were presented in a biased fashion, um, you know, by white scholars who didn't have a more comprehensive look. But along the way, it became possible in K through 16 to get through without the core courses and ideas that you need to move, to go to Washington where I send lots of students to the Hill and begin writing legislation. And I say this all the time, it's hard to defend the West when you don't know what it is. There's actually something worth defending and we've got to teach it. 
<laughs> it's not about the Insurrection Act and making sure that you go on Wikipedia and know when and when it should not be applied. You have to have a deeper understanding as a citizen. And we don't have it because of what we've allowed to happen in K through 16. Um, while I think the diversity issue is a big national security problem, I actually think K through 16, which includes that, is the biggest national security threat we have in this nation because of what it now does not do. Well, I could hardly agree more. And I don't know that I'm going to add anything, but Dr. Skinner has said it all. I mean, that's exactly the point. We have hollowed out our understanding of our own nation and what it should be. And as Obama said, yes, it's an imperfect union, and that's what we should be striving for to make it more perfect. But if we don't understand it and we don't know, we don't appreciate what it has done so far, how to improve it becomes a very challenging prospect. And and I would also add that um, it's important that we you know reincorporate these important things into the curriculum um, for K through 12. Um, but I think it's also important that we accurately um, portray our history and what has happened and how, uh, because, you know, quite frankly, when many of us were in school, um, there were critical parts of our history that were just left out of our textbooks. And we can't afford to allow that to happen again. So I think that there is a um, very unique opportunity here, right? Um, to kind of like look at this and, and look at it, you know, from the bottom up and to make sure that we are doing actually the best job and presenting the material um, in an unbiased and, you know, very accurate fashion to um, our K through 12 graders who really deserve that. If I could add one comment to that, which I'm in complete agreement about, I think our teacher core has a real presents a real problem for us because they too have not been educated in how one handles these very challenging and terribly important topics. And so as we try to figure out ways to improve our K through 12 educational process, we're gonna to have to keep in mind that we're going to have to give professional training to our teacher core who have simply not been required to understand these things either. And I want to add that I think education is the biggest national security threat issue that we never speak of in that context. And I think we need to talk about it in, in those kinds of terms because it really, really is. And this brings us to uh, the, the end of this conversation. Dr. Kyron Skinner, Elizabeth Riskoff parker when. Uh, and Wendy Parker, thank you so much for being here and thank you for this great discussion. I want to invite the audience to tune in again here tomorrow at 4 p.m. for part two of this discussion, which will be led by my colleague, Suzanne Spaulding. And uh, we also want to, again, th give a special thank you to our funder, the Craig Newmark Philanthropies. And now here is Dr. John Hamry, the president and CEO of CSIS with closing remarks. Dr. Hannon? Uh, you know, Beverly, thank you. This has been just a remarkable conversation. I think this is the first time in, I've been here 20 years. I think it's the first time when we've had, you know, five women who've led a discussion. Gosh, it's been great. It's been, it's been wonderful. Um, and I've been wondering what to say. Um, you know, I, uh, let me just share something. I don't remember the precise words, but it was generally the words that Rabbi Gittelson, who was part of the commemoration of the cemetery at Iwo Jima. Uh, I have a, I'm named after an uncle who was buried at Iwo Jima. And I, I don't remember his precise words, but I remember precisely what he was saying. And he said, um, you know, here lie these men side by side. They now don't care about the color of each other's skin. They don't care about the passions of their religions. Um, here they lie, a perfect democracy. They fought and died for America, not for what it is, but what we can become. And I think that's been the spirit of this conversation. Thank you all.
I'm so grateful to be with you. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.